Matt Mackay. Okay, I normally talk really loud, but I have this mic on, so you guys in the back, can you hear me okay? Yes? Good. Okay, I'll try to talk at this, this volume throughout my talk. So, I'm actually really excited to be here. It's great to be in Boston. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm here. I'm on this road trip for five months, and I'll, I'll get into that, but this is my 29th city in the last five months. And uh, I've had an opportunity to speak at some other Python and Django meetups, and um, it was a great turnout, particularly considering that it is absolutely beautiful outside. So uh, thank you guys for being here. So this is staying sane while taking over an existing Django code base. And um, let me, I'll just sort of basically tell you about a little bit about my background, and then I'll dive into the, into the talk itself. So, this is the slide I always show when I'm giving like a non-technical talk, particularly to project managers, because they kind of freak out. But like, what? Wait, I didn't know there was going to be code in this talk. But basically, my name is Matt McKay. I'm a. I consider myself a full-stack developer, front to back. Um, I'll even dive into Illustrator or Photoshop when necessary. But I essentially just I touch all areas of the stack. I know when to call for backup when there's something that is particularly challenging, say a database tuning problem or something like that. Um, but I try to go the full length. Um, I've been working with Django since 0.96. So about five years ago, I got into it. I was doing Java development, J2E. How many of you guys have done or are currently doing J2E development? Just a show of hands. OK, a few people in the room. I just found that I could not believe how little work it seems like we actually got done as a team of 15 developers. <coughs> and I started looking for other things that were out there. And I just explored. And Rails was interesting. It was still developing at that point. Obviously, Django was still developing. For me personally, and probably for many of you guys as well, the explicit over implicit and the getting not having the magic, just having it be out there, what was actually going on, really resonated with me. It just sort of fit my programming style. Not to say that there's not a lot that's great in the Rails community, but that's how I got into it originally about five years ago. And I stuck with it, and, um, and then ultimately led me to uh, do a lot of work in the area, which this talk is based on. <clears throat> do some work with data visualization. I've got a nice one uh, from D3JS D3 visualization in this presentation. By the way, this is uh, all of the uh, stuff I have on my blog, which is created in Helicon, a static site generator. Um, all this is just open source on GitHub. So if you're interested in this presentation, um, this one is, uh, I was using Impress.js, then I used Deck.js, and this one is, I'm using a different JavaScript uh, framework. This is Reveal.js. So if you're just kind of curious about, about this, this is um, just taking a look at the code. It's just a simple HTML file with a, with a theme on it. You can take a look at the source code at some point. I do a lot of prototypes, and then a lot of times I'm called in for the sort of oh crap moments where someone has a site that's up and running and it's been doing well for a while and then all of a sudden they get a traffic surge and the thing falls down and they're like, what are our bottlenecks? What are we doing with this? Or it's just the code base has evolved to the point where it doesn't seem like anybody can get anything done. And so I am called in and I sort of parachute in as, as Nate said and take a look at the code base and try to figure out, well, what, where do we go from here? And normally I live in Washington, D.C. So uh, I'm pretty heavily involved in the Python community in DC. If you guys were ever down there and taking a trip down there, shoot me an email. I'd be more than happy to show you around the city, get you involved with the local Python scene or the startup scene, that sort of thing. I, it would be great, because you guys have basically done that for me. I'd, I'd love to get, uh, get back and do that to you, so you guys as well. So the reason why I'm here is actually this project that I'm doing, which is I've entitled Coding Across America. Not to be confused with Code for America. Those guys are awesome. I was at their headquarters in San Francisco when I was out there, uh, but we're not like affiliated. Um, so I basically just created this project where I wanted to get out of DC for a while. And I designed this five month road trip. Uh, basically, the idea was road trip to 30 cities in five months. The original idea was I was just going to sit in coffee shops or sit outside, just check out a city, and just code and just work on whatever I felt like working on. And it evolved to the point where people were like, oh, you know, you should meet with so-and-so in this city. You should talk to this startup. So I mixed that in there. And so I got the learning experience of not only checking out these new interesting cities, but I also had an opportunity to talk to a lot of cool organizations. I think at this point I've talked to 65 or 70 organizations around the country and just kind of got an idea of 
what's the what's the tech scene like in Memphis, Tennessee? What's the tech scene like in Austin? How do these things compare? And then also, how do you build a really great developer community? Um, it seems like you guys don't have too much of a problem with that, but um, you know, in certain cities, smaller cities like Omaha, they're still trying to figure out their Python scene. So um, I thought all of that stuff was was really interesting. If you're interested in in building developer communities, I have a presentation. It's the last one that I gave at Omaha Python. Everything is on mattmckay.com under the presentations link. So this is the this is the route that I took. I started out in Washington D.C. about five months ago in March 9th, and I went south very quickly. I went through Charlotte, North Carolina, into New Orleans. I was down there for New Orleans Entrepreneurship Week. If you get a chance to go down to New Orleans for Entrepreneurship Week, is it absolutely is just wild. They basically have this open bar with hundreds of people, and these three entrepreneurs pitch their uh, very fledgling companies to the audience. And after two hours of open bar, like people got really rowdy. And <laughs> the, and what was great was like that was actually part of the judging criteria was how loud are people after the pitch. Um, and then they had guys like uh, Archie Manning and someone someone from Tremay, like they had a bunch of people there um, who were the the panel. So it was like half and half, and you just sort of half half the audience being really rowdy and half the the panel judging these these different companies. So it was like entrepreneurship world style. So I've seen a lot of that stuff throughout my trip. It's been really fantastic. Um, if you guys are interested in that stuff, I, I have a site. It's codingacrossamerica.com. I blog about this stuff. I take pictures. I talk about a bunch of the startups around the country. I'm basically building a resource that is, if you're interested in, in a tech scene in one of the cities, um, basically you can see some pictures. You can see what startups are there. And then I have an aggregation of really great links that are like, what are the best community curated resources? So even in some place like Eugene, Oregon, which is like a pretty small city, um, they still have a ton of really cool technology stuff that's going on, and they have a lot of really great community curated resources. So I basically built a, a little bit of an aggregation of that. Um, so I went through the south, and of course went through you know, San Francisco, and up the west coast, uh, and then came back east. And so now uh, I'm here in Boston for my 29th city. <coughs> So yeah, so as I said, uh, meeting startups. One thing that I thought was really interesting was just like the little hooks that different companies had. So this is a company in Austin, Texas called Copper Egg. And how many, have you guys used Copper Egg? Just a show of hands, has anybody used Copper Egg before? It's, how many of you guys use New Relic? Okay, cool, so New Relic is out of San Francisco. They started out, they're like, we're gonna be application, application monitoring metrics availability. Copper Egg started, so, that, so New Relic is sort of top down from the application, of, at the application layer of the stack on down, and that's where they're building out. Copper Egg started on like the servers. They're like, well, we're gonna measure CPU utilization, memory, disk space, all that, and then we're gonna climb up the stack. And so they are competitors, but not like direct competitors. They've sort of tucked, they've, they've come and sort of met in the middle. So if you guys are having problems with say like, um, you know, just like servers and, and infrastructure, it's more in the DevOps space. Um, but one thing I thought was really interesting was they had this marketing strategy where they had this little plastic egg. They did a, took a Sharpie, a black Sharpie, and they put these like little sunglasses on this thing. And they take it with them with like to all their comp all the conferences they go to, like people go on vacation. They take pictures with it everywhere. And so they have like a Facebook fan page. And a lot of the people on there like have no idea like what copper egg is like they're not <laughs> but they love this little like plastic egg. They're like, that's so cool. Like I mean, I just thought it was a really interesting idea. It's like how do tech companies sort of like broaden their the people that are interested in like what they're doing or broaden their brand? And I thought that was just a really great sort of book. So I've sort of seen like, things like that meeting with tech, uh, some of the tech startups. A lot of it's just coding. This is a picture of me sitting in, in or actually my computer and a cup of coffee when I was sitting in Chicago, just outside, and just working on some, some projects for, uh, for one of my clients. So that's been really great. It's just kind of sitting outside, and I had never been to Chicago before. Um, as a side note, how many of you guys are going to DjangoCon in Chicago in a few weeks? Just show of hands, DjangoCon. Okay, cool, a few people. I will be there, so please come talk to me afterwards. Like, let's let's meet up at DjangoCon. I'd love to, love to talk to you guys. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so this was my first trip to Chicago a few weeks ago. I'll be back there for DjangoCon in a few weeks. And then just generally, like, getting out of the building. So, like, the whole Steve Blank, like, customer discovery, get out of the building and, like, talk to people. I definitely did a lot of talking to people, but it was also just, like, this is hiking in Colorado. Loveland Pass is, like, amazing out there. And just kind of 
just getting away from things, getting away from the technology, because I, I do feel like it's, when you're a developer, sometimes you get so focused on like the specific problems that you're solving, and it really helps just to like kind of get away and do things that are like outside of what you normally would do. Like I don't live in Colorado, just getting out there and climbing up 12,000 feet, is like you know, just kind of broadens your perspective on things. Uh, this is a visualization of the miles that I've driven per day. Uh, so with the blue, the tiny little blue bars, those are the miles driven per day. Uh, the largest one, I think, is this is actually, um, I have this on my on codingacrossamerica.com. This one right here is when I drove from Charlotte to New Orleans, which was like 720 miles in a single day, like 12 hours. Um, it, was, it was a long haul. But what I thought was really interesting, and the reason why I like to show this is because Granted, it's a little like snazzy D3 visualization, but besides that is the fact that like you look at things over time. When you're working on something day in, day out, a lot of times you don't see the bigger picture, like what you're actually accomplishing. And yes, granted, it's just miles driven, but I think it's amazing how these tiny bars are dwarfed by the aggregate number of miles that have been driven. And I think that that also is something that is a perspective that sometimes as developers we we don't think about, like we're like day in and day out trying to fix one bug or something like that. When you can step back and you can see this aggregate view of what you created, I think that's like a really powerful motivator. And I think there's still a lot of areas in which we can improve projects um, where we can sort of show, show the things that we've created over time as opposed to just day in and day out number of commits. Okay, so anyway, that's just sort of my, my uh, the reason why I'm here, my background, like why I'm speaking tonight. Um, but I really, what I really want you guys to get out of this is like taking over an existing Django code base. Um, so how many of you guys, just show of hands, will, like have just started within like, so say like the last year with Django? Okay, good number of people, okay. Um, so this is a pretty, uh, I'd say this is like an intermediate level talk, but probably a good one if you've just started in the last year. A really good one to, to if you, if you have enough familiarity with just the basics, this can be a really good one to kind of broaden your perspective about what are some of the best practices that are, that are out there. And the general idea behind this is, I've, I've basically had a bunch of client engagements recently where I had to just dive into a code base, an existing code base, and I've seen, here's some things that are done really well, and here's some things that are done just really poorly. And often I'm asked, well, you know, what's, what's your estimate for the, the fix or the estimate or the, uh, the enhancement or, or whatnot? And it's really hard to understand that unless there's enough of these things that I'm going to, that I'm going to talk about tonight to provide, I'd say like mile markers for like where the code base is, like where it's going, like what the problems are and what, what sort of shape it's in in general. It, it basically, if you have a lot of this stuff, um, one side is, you know, I can jump in quickly, or some, uh, you know, someone who's new to the project can jump in quickly. But the other side of it is, like, you, a lot of you guys are working with established code bases, and when you're doing things day in and day out, you can kind of forget that there's some basics that you might be missing, and that can come back and bite you later if you have, say, a junior developer who joins the team, and you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how you can ramp them up. So I did a lot of trial and error, and I, I wrote a blog post. Hopefully you guys saw the blog post. I linked to it on the uh, Meetup page, uh, and I, I tweeted it out. But it's uh, basically a blog post that, I'm, uh, that I have my thoughts out there. It's basically a more detailed version of this presentation. This presentation just sort of combines and aggregates a lot of that stuff um, and just sort of simplifies it for like a presentation audience. Um, basically, the idea is like where do you start? And so I'm going to sort of start with the code base, and, and I'll, I'll walk you through that. Um, so again, why should you care about this talk? Like, what should you come out of this talk with tonight? Basically, the idea would be you come out of this talk with, and it's going to be different for everybody, but there's going to probably be two or three things that you say, you know what, my code base doesn't do that very well. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to make an effort to do that because it's really important for the long-term health of the code base. If you have this technical debt that builds up over time, and you really want to figure out a way to get rid of some of that technical debt so that you can continue to to charge forward in what you're developing over time. So the approach for tonight, there's basically like four things. I was trying to figure out, like, this is sort of an agenda slide. This is heavily front-loaded in the code base side of things. I talked a little bit about deployment. I talked less in services. 
Uh, I'm actually prepping a talk. I it depends whether it's accepted to Django Con or not. It'll be on uh, the services, like what, how do you handle like best practices around third-party services, like if you're integrating Stripe for payments or Urban Airship for push notifications, those sorts of things. What are the best practices around that? I don't touch on that as much in this. I'm talking specifically about in this presentation. I'm going to talk specifically about you get the code base, like. Then what? Like, what are the steps? What's your first two hours with the code base? Like, what should you be looking for? And if you have like a checklist, like, what should you be? What boxes should you be checking? And then I like to give a lot of resources at the end of the presentation, so I'll give you like a list of stuff you can look into. Particularly if you're relatively new to Django, I think that stuff if you haven't heard of it before is going to be very useful. You can kind of absorb some of this information tonight and then go back later on, take a look through it, and take a look at some of the resources, and that should hopefully help you. Um, uh, just develop things. Uh, you guys hearing echo in this? I did a little echo. Good? Cool. All right, we're set. Um, the resources just kind of help you to go back later on and learn more. Okay, so let's dive into the, the code base perspective. We're basically trying to determine a few things. First would be just obtaining the code. Then taking a look at the README, and I'm a strong proponent of just having a README that just kind of explains things. So I'll talk about like, what should be in a README. The project structure, Django's changed project structures over time. It used to just not have any sort of project structure or a very loose project structure. Now there's one that's a more standard project structure. So figuring that part out. Um, dependency management, settings configuration, data, and tests. So that's essentially what in the first couple of hours of taking a look at a code base, you should be able to figure out all these different pieces and have a good idea of the state of the code base. Okay, so I'm going to use this example project. I like to have some screenshots up there just because it's more interesting to look at than just like plain old text. I developed this web application like a few years ago. It's called Proof Driven. You can take a look at it if you want. It's proofdriven.com. I basically developed a web app from like start to finish. Um, handled everything myself. I just wanted to make sure I touched all the pieces, deployed it through a traditional LAMP stack, hardened the server, everything that went along with that. Um, basically what this thing does is it, let's say your company is not using version control. Leave. <laughs> but if you want to convince them that they should go from no version control to say Git, then what this will do is you punch in a bunch of uh, project estimates uh, or basically assumptions. So what's your team size and what's the project cost, like a bunch of different uh, assumptions. And then it will spit out this like nicely formatted report that basically says like, here's how much money your company is losing per day because of you know, developers merge conflicts and the, catastrophic, the potential loss for catastrophic data loss, those sorts of things. And it basically says, like, you're losing $1,500 a day because you're not using version control. It tries to basically enforce best practices from a financial standpoint. So when you see some screenshots, and I may have just mentioned things, it's going to be off of this web application, which I actually developed. And going back and looking at it from a few years ago, I'm like, wow, there's a ton of things that need to be improved about this project. Um, this is not open source. At some point, what I'll do is I'll take the existing code base, I'll uh, open source it, but I'll like talk about how you can take this like pretty crappy, um, you know, code base and then improve it to uh, best practices that are like used today. Okay, so the first thing is, as I sort of alluded to, you need to obtain the code. So. Um, it's amazing how many situations you get yourself into as a consultant where you're like, cool, let me just take a look at the code. And then it takes you like weeks to get a hold of it. It just seems kind of crazy. Um, it's gotten a little bit better with GitHub, like with companies that are on GitHub. But still, you need to have step one as being just obtaining the code base. So once you clone the repo, I'm, uh, I'm just like a huge proponent of just like playing around the command line. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the advice here is just going to be like, here's some things that you can run from the command line just to kind of figure things out, like you know, just using find and wrap and that sort of thing. <laughs> so you get this code base, right? And then you get the code base, you can either do I, I use Vim for everything. You can do a VI on the, the README or just read it through GitHub. But there's basically some things that you want to see in the README. And it's amazing how many readme's I see that are just like you know, two words, like, this is the remain or something like that, something <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but you really want to have some sort of purpose and goals and summary, like, what is the purpose of this? Even, like, and it has to be something simple, like something that you should be able to remember. I don't want to see, like, you know, a whole 
project charter. I'm like, I really like documentation that is very specific and targeted, and that you definitely need that in the code base. But you don't want to have some boilerplate that's just like, you know, a bunch of stuff. I mean, we, a lot of us have seen, particularly if you work in larger organizations, uh, you've seen you know, these large boilerplate project charters. That's not what you want to see in the readme. What you want is just, you know, what's a one or two sentence summary? This is a financial application that tracks X, Y, and Z. And then what are the goals? You know, we were, you know, we were even something like. And we were putting it in context. We were losing $2 million a year. We built this web application because now we can track certain funds going from, from you know, one, one place to another, and that's saving us X amount of money. Um, just some context, like what is this project? The second thing would be important links, like under, underneath the purpose and goals and summary, some important links. So what are the IP addresses for like staging? I mean, it depends on how extensive your infrastructure is. A lot of what I deal with is just you know one or two or three servers. We're not talking about like some massive AWS cluster of different you know hundreds of servers. That's probably going to be a different scale. Um, I'm coming from you know just you have a few servers or one server that's your production environment, staging, testing environments. Like what are the IP addresses for those things? And then just what are some important links? Like just give me a link to like the currently running test test application that's out there. The third thing would be getting started. So how many of you guys use, by uh, show of hands, use Vagrant? OK, that's pretty good. So I like Vagrant. Not everyone's used Vagrant. So it can be a little bit confusing, particularly if you have more junior, intermediate level developers. You should, you're getting started if you're using Vagrant and you're keeping your VMs up to date. And that's, like, that's what you're developing off of. You should still have in your getting started section, like, here's how you set up Vagrant. Like, even if you want to just point to a link where it's like, here's how you install it, whatnot, but just talk about that. And usually, I found that there's certain things that like aren't necessarily included with a Vagrant VM. So if your Vagrant VM is hitting like a solar server that's you know somewhere else, uh, like you have a hosted solar server or something like that, then like you should just talk about that. Like getting started, what happens if that connection is not there or you're not connected to the internet? Why is the internet? Why is why is that important? And just how is this thing going to get up and running for a new developer who doesn't know anything about the application? If you're not using Vagrant, that's fine too. Um, just talk about you know, virtual env and, and pip and how you install dependencies and those sorts of things and the type of environment that you usually do the development on. I do everything on Ubuntu and then I deploy to Ubuntu or I deploy to Heroku, um, which is essentially a, a 10.04 LTS release. Um, so, that's the environment that I expect the code to be written in, or to be run in. And so if someone's trying to run that from Mac, I would just say something like, you know, you just need to set this up on a Mac differently, or you need to install the dependencies through Homebrew or something like that. But at least it's a note that says, here's the expectation. And so if there's something that diverges from that expectation, at least that person knows. And then special instructions I would have. So after the getting started, it would be like, you sort of dive into some other details. So for example, you're using Solar, Django Haystack, something like that. How do you set that thing up? Because not everyone has, has used that before. So just having some special instructions about how you do that. Um, database replication, so if you're able to pull the data from the database, uh, like a production or a testing database, so you have your test data, that's going to be uh, important to put in the special instructions. And then just from a deployment perspective, what's the basics of the deployment? How is this application deployed? So I'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's like, you know, is it done through with Capistrano? Is it done with Ansible <laughs> or Fabric Scripts? Like, just at a glance, what is it? You can link to more comprehensive documentation. But like, that is a pretty solid readme where it gives you enough context. You're like, okay, cool. Like, I sort of like understand where this is, like, where this application lives. I sort of understand how to set it up. It's just enough of like a set up guide that you're like, okay, I think I can do this on my own. Um, that's really the sort of general feeling you're going for when a new developer looks at your project and is like, well, okay, now I need to get started. By the way, if you guys have any questions, I usually mention this at the beginning, if you guys have any questions, please just raise your hand, put them out, you're not going to like disrupt my flow or anything like that. So ask questions at any moment. So we have the code. We've got some, you know, context with a readme. I like to just go in with the command line and just start poking around. 
I want to say poking around I mean, in a structured way. But I basically just do a you know, do an ls with a list and a little bit of details. Um, ls dash lrta ltra is like one of my favorite commands because just displays everything. I know what the directories are, then I can grep on that. And so this is going to show us like the basic project structure. So the, you guys who have only been doing Django for like a year, as that's actually in some ways an advantage because the Django community is at a point where we kind of understand some of our, our conventions, like how should a project be structured? It didn't always used to be that way. Um, how many of you guys know like what named URLs are or use named URLs? Just like raise your hands. Okay. If you guys don't know what named URLs are, like in templates and stuff, take a look at that. But when I started with Django, like I didn't know what name there were actually well I didn't know what named URLs because they hadn't been like and been like invented in Django yet. Um, now getting started, like there's so much more documentation out there, and there are conventions for like how you should actually do stuff that it can actually be an advantage to start later with Django. So if you feel like, oh, I don't know what Django 1.3 had, like don't worry about it. Obviously, if you're working with a code base that's 1.3 already, you're going to have to go back and learn some of that what's not there. But it can be an advantage to start later within the the, uh, the life cycle of a framework. So Django project structure in 1.3 and earlier, um, as of a few years ago, it was a pretty flat hierarchy. This was like fairly standard, where you would have the project root, and then you have your settings, your URLs, your whiskey.py, manage.py, all in the basic like home directory. And then your apps, your individual apps, your app directories would just fall off of that. So when I go into a code base, and I see this, I'm thinking, oh, either this is a 1.3 project, 1.3 or earlier project, or it's some sort of weird mix of someone trying to upgrade this but didn't necessarily do it in a way that like a normal 1.4 plus project would be con configured. So that'd be something to like watch out for if you're like looking at a code base and they say, well, yeah, it's 1.5, but then you see this and you're like, well, but that doesn't really jive. Because 1.4 introduced the concept of having the project name under like the project root directory, and then that's where a lot of your settings and your URLs and WSGI uh, pi files go, and then the manage.py points to those files in this in this directory, and then your again your apps would hang off of that. But sometimes you'll see something that's like kind of custom, which is you'll have this like modified manage.py, which is like sort of like this hybrid where someone's like actually added a bunch of code to manage.py because it's just Python after all. And then maybe you have this flat hierarchy, or maybe you even have something like you have an apps directory. So someone didn't feel comfortable just putting the individual apps in the project root. They wanted an apps directory. So that's something to watch out for, is just looking at the basic project structure, you can kind of see. I prefer to stick to the conventions, like the, the 1.4 plus conventions. There may be a reason for the custom, so that would be something that if you have access to the current developers, you'd ask them, like, why are we using this project structure? It's something to take a look for and say, um, you know, is there a reason for doing this? There may be a, a, a good reason to do that. Maybe you have, you know, 30 apps, in which case you want to have them on your subdirectories. But for the most part, you, you want to stick to the basic conventions so that, you know, if you're upgrading from Django 1.5 to 1.6, if there's any sort of complications with that, uh, from a convention standpoint, you're not going to hit those problems. So let's talk about dependencies. So do more on requirements.txt file. How many of you guys, just show of hands, how many of you guys peg your dependencies to specific versions or specific like tags or gits? Right? Okay, cool, that's pretty good. Like so, the versions? What's that? Like range, like at least this version or higher. That as well, yeah. Although I yeah. So yeah. Um, I actually, that is better than this, but I much prefer to see specific versions. Um, this is really what you want to see, because you know exactly like what this was built for. And what's amazing is like even if one of these things, so I'll, I'll tell you like why, why should you peg your dependencies and peg them to specific versions or specific git tags. I jumped into this project for one of my clients, currently running web application, and 
they wanted to transition. There was a consulting company that was running the environment. They wanted to transition it to the client's environment. And they were like, hey, can you help with this transition? Sure. I'm getting the environment set up. And they had one dependency that was not pegged. And uh, so for you guys who have used like Jinja 2 templating, um, there's always that question like, can I use a different templating system with Django? And the answer is like, yes, you can. Uh, there's actually a, a project called Coffin, uh, a dependency called Coffin, or library. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So there's something called Coffin, which basically allows you to use these Gen2 templates with Django. And you know, I didn't, there was no, it wasn't pegged to a specific dependency. So I was like, okay, fine. Like, uh, you know, it just went and got the latest when I did a pip um, and saw, you know, requirements on text. And so the whole thing, like the, the project just didn't work. And it was because, and this, this was a project running one too, and it was complaining about class-based views. So, Luckily, I had sort of like grown up with like the Django framework that I understood that class-based views hadn't been a part of the Django framework until 1.3. But I like had this back and forth email chain with a consulting company that created the project. And I was like, class-based views don't exist in Django 1.2. You're using Django 1.2. And they're like, no, you know, we don't know what's going on. Apparently, like two weeks later, the, the reason why this whole argument back and forth stopped when I was trying just to figure out what the dependency was. The reason why it stopped was because I guess someone hit pip install upgrade in their production environment. The whole thing just crapped out on them. Like their production environment was just like blown up. And they like had all this downtime. They couldn't figure out like what happened. It was that one dependency, like one missing dependency. Everything else was pegged. And it was because Coffin had used class-based views in a newer version that they hadn't used before in their production environment. So that I think to me like was really the turning point where I was like, peg everything. And certainly you can do at a higher version. Um, you know, you might be able to do it on Django or something like that, but it still can be dangerous because even if they had used Coffin, you know, version plus, then it would have had the same problem. Do you, do you have thoughts about how to handle the fact that some of your dependencies made themselves not peg their dependencies and thus bite you in the end? Yeah, um, so and I think that's really where testing comes in and just being able to like rebuild your environments on a, on a regular basis. Uh, I mean, there's really, um, there's no perfect solution to that, unfortunately. Um, I handled a project recently where I just, I had to upgrade a few <coughs> dependencies at once. And I ran into some of that, that issue. Like it was, so it was a uh, Haystack, Django Haystack with Pi Solar. And there were some Unicode issues with like the very latest version of PySolar. And um, I had to roll back to a previous version. But luckily, it was only just like uh, like three dependencies that I was upgrading. And so I was able to isolate the cause in a test environment um, before it became a bigger issue. And so that's the only thing is like, what I do is I just upgrade the dependencies either one at a time or finding out, like, reading the release notes, OK, we've upgraded. This only supports a certain version. A certain version. That's basically the best way you can do it, and it's very manual, unfortunately. And I was at a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> and someone was, took a more extreme view, and I'd like your opinion on this. Uh, in his view, um, you just have to require your developers to find out all the dependencies of all the dependencies of all the dependencies and list them explicitly in the requirements.txt. Uh, that seems like a lot of work, but it definitely makes the problem go away. What's your take on this? So, you have to take on I was actually going to ask, I mean, it sounds like, you know, if there's all this manual work, you know, is there a tool that does dependency analysis? Like doing, like, like, like PyLint for analyzing Python code, but something that would go through and, and walk and walk through um, what the dependencies are in the packages after running uh, the install with requirements. So, I wouldn't say that there's a perfectly automated solution to this problem. And uh, there is, I see a project uh, that is, you can either self-host or it's hosted called PyPy Notifier, which will actually notify you when new uh, dependencies come out, like when there's a new version that comes out. The other way to sort of handle that is rebuilding your environment and reinstalling your virtual M and having a test case, having a test case. That, that, and I'm gonna, I'll cover that stuff, like the, 
what you want to look for with a test case. But even just having like smoke tests on your basic pages is going to tell you like when you do the rebuild, like whether that actually worked or not. So what I do is I have a lot of like I'll use Django Jenkins or something like that, and I'll just blow away the virtual env every once in a while, and then I'll reinstall the dependencies, and if that blows up, that shows you that okay something something's been a problem with dependencies. I think if you do pip freeze, it'll capture all the dependencies, including your dependencies yeah. dependencies in your virtual environment. Yeah, so I may I may have uh, misinterpreted the question. Yes, you can do a pip freeze and it will actually give you like that right there. Uh, so it'll 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 peg all of your specific dependencies. So what I do is I just do a pip freeze and then you know pump that out to a file and that's what your current working environment is. All right, so let's go into the uh, settings configuration. So there's a bunch of different ways that settings have sort of evolved over time. The, the, the basic problem with settings is your settings are going to be different in your development environment, your test environment, and your production environment, and whatever, you know, maybe your continuous integration environment. So you're not going to be using your production Stripe payments key in your test environment. So that has, that has, to, that has to change somewhere. So one way that people sort of handle this is like the, the first sort of way is you could do you could just change it in your settings.py, right? You could literally go in and modify your settings.py um, in your development environment and not change that, not check that in, uh, or that makes up the SVN term, not not commit that um, and get to your to your repository and like push it to production. You just change it in your in your local environment. But like just seems like a really bad situation because like what if you actually do have changes that you want to commit to your repository? So that's where like some people will do like a, sort of a mangling of like manage.py where they'll like put things on the Python path or they'll put their changes in manage.py and that also is like not really a sustainable situation. So the two ways that people usually handle the settings configuration, I mean, if, it, if it's a different way than one of these two things, it's, I don't know, it, it would be really interesting to see how well and how sustainable that situation is. The first way would be you have a local settings.py file. So I'd actually be interested by a show of hands, how many of you guys use like a local settings.py file, like a template file in your project? Okay, cool. Yeah, that's about what I was expecting. And then environment variables, how many people just use straight up environment variables? That's less than I expected, okay. Um, that's fine. So if you're using a local settings.py uh, template, then take a look at environment, setting environment variables. There's a few libraries that will do this, uh, but there's also, like I'll show you the way that I do it, which is not necessarily the canonical way by any means, but it is like one way of handling this, and it's very simple. So local settings.py, you just, you know, you, you do and you're get ignore local settings.py, you know, the template's out there, you fill in your template when you check out the project or you, you clone the repository, and then you just like, you're up and running. Um, the other way would be environment variables. So this is the way that I recommend. Certainly, I've done local settings.py for a long time, and it's, I think it's a sustainable situation. I just think that environment variables are a more sustainable way of handling it, and it's also the way that Heroku does it. So when I was doing a lot of work with Heroku, I just kind of got used to using environment variables. So I was just like, this is just the way to do it. So um, hopefully I checked in the back, you guys can see this. I'll just walk through it real quick. This is a function that I have in my settings.py file, which is basically defining a function to get an environment setting. And when, there's a, there's a few imports which basically, um, Actually, I'll, I'll, post, I'll post something that'll be an elaboration on this. But basically, you're trying to get this, this setting from the environment, uh, the, like the environment uh, dictionary. So if it's not in there, then it won't allow you to do whatever manage.py setting or uh, manage.py command that you're trying to run. So if you're trying to do run server, it'll basically, and you haven't set the things that, as environment variables, it'll just say, like, you have to set this, and it'll say improperly configured error message, throw an exception, you have to set this specific environment variable. This is really handy when you add like a new third party service and you just completely forget in your local environment that oh right, I need to add, you know, like Twilio. I forgot, I forgot to need like some sort of Twilio uh, key. So it'll just, kind of, it'll just kind of say, hey, add this environment variable. 
And then all it does is it just gets, gets that environment variable. So this, in this case, normally debug is going to be set to false in a production environment. In your development and test environments, can be set to true. So it's just uh, environment setting. And then this is like what my local and vari my local environment variable settings are. So, um, so in this case, my local environment variable is ex uh, I do an export debug equals true. On Heroku, you do like a Heroku config setting. I forget the exact command, but basically you set that environment variable for Heroku, and that way, like you can push the exact same code repository to Heroku, and it's going to work. And then you can also just, I just run this shell script. So I run my virtual end, and then I run the shell script, and bam, all my environment variables are there. And then when I have a new one, I just add it. Um, and I actually just, I usually just check this in like with the repository, and um, as long as it's like my local settings, it's usually not a big, uh, big deal to just have it in there. Um, but you could get ignored as well and add it to like a separate repository. Okay, so you got, yeah, sorry. Okay. What do you think about um, having uh, local settings files that are not if get ignored, but that where you just set your Django settings module environment variable, and then you can have all of those? Yeah. Um, so you're set. The thing is, you're setting the what the you're setting the um, the cert module to that that local settings so file. You just have one environment variable, which is you say your Django mm -hmm. settings module right. environment variable, and that sets it to your own yeah. your local or to the. Yeah, it's sort of like a hybrid. I mean, like I said, I think that either one is, is sustainable. Um, and I think it's just whatever you're comfortable with. The thing about that, I guess, yeah, you, you can still do that on Heroku because you're setting that one environment variable and then that would handle the handle it. Yeah. Oh, so I was gonna say going back with that, what about running um, under Apache with uh, mod whiskey, you know, setting your environment variables in the uh, whiskey comp file? So I should know more about Apache than I do. I use Nginx a lot, and I use just Green Unicorn, so I'm way more familiar with that type of environment than so, I am with Apache. So with that, you could just you know run this process and just be able to set an environment variable, and then the server would be able to take them? So the way that I'm handling, so the way with Green Unicorn, you're just using a virtual lamp, right? And I assume it's basically the same thing with, with ModWiski, um, which is you have your virtual environment, and then you just are like upon startup of your server, you're just going to like set these environment variables. If you're just doing a traditional LAMP stack, right? Like, uh, so basically you're just going to run that like shell script in your like, in your, like you do, you activate your virtual M and there are also ways of setting uh, environment variables in virtual M as well. I just tended to stay away from that just because it's just so easy to like export the environment variables in, um, in, in like the Linux. So, I don't know if I totally answer your question. No, no, I just I have to I play with it more because that was something I was trying to figure out. You know, running because you're running Apache. You know, as, as Apache user, as HTTP um, uh, or, or www whatever it happens to be. Right. But you're running it as a user that doesn't have a login. So therefore, at least with what I know, um, which I'm not an expert, I'm just learning, figuring it out. Right. Um, that you don't have the environment variables there. So what I figured out what to do. Is, is options are is to set it, um, you know, in one of three places. Is either set it um, in um, the, uh, the the whiskey comp file, mm -hmm. um, set it in your uh, your whiskey file that it will then go launch this with your app that that would be like for Django in there, or as you had shown before, options and settings or you know in your template. So yeah. one of those three areas in order to set the in order to set your environment. Uh, yeah, so I mean, essentially, what you just need is like you just need that hook yeah. into like uh, a shell script, or um, you can export these things from like a Python script, which it sounds like you're you can do that as well. You just need the hook into there. Yeah. I think yeah. That's something we are doing um, almost exactly the way you're describing it, I think. So if you feel free to, we can prepare to share Yeah. Yeah, I also need that too. Okay. Uh, auto EMV, which is the one where when you CD into the directory, it yeah. hooks you into the virtual end automatically, and you can also set environment variables. At yeah. the same time. So it's nice for not forgetting to run the environment variables for us. Yeah. There's, there's a ton of ways to uh, set environment variables. And so usually what ends up happening is people just kind of like do one way, and they're just kind of like, you know, fire and forget, and they don't really worry about it anymore. 
Um, but there's like, you know, there's there's actually Python projects which will like set environment variables for you for you. I think um, like one of the Django core committers actually has has one as well. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways. It's basically just the general idea though from a high level perspective is like there's two ways of doing this that are both like pretty much acceptable. Um, the local settings and the environment variables, and then obviously the devil's in the details, but there's a few different ways. Just to say, the thing you stumbled across was that um, the, 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 the environment that you set inside the WishGCom is not the same as the, as, the, as the operating system environment. There's like another layer, so you sort of have to pass it through twice from the yeah. object, from the environment to the WSG object. So that's, if, if you're stuck, that may be one of the things you might be stuck on. Thank you. Okay, so basically we've set our environment variables uh, somehow, or we've set our settings somehow, and basically at this point I'm saying, okay, I just want to do like a Python manage on high. I want to know what settings are, uh, or what, what things are available to me, um, and we're using south for migrations, uh, but basically I'm just trying to be able to, be able to run some basic manage on high commands, um, and then ultimately run tests, and then do the run server. So there's a couple different things uh, left. One is the data, right? So let's say I'm successful in doing the run server. Well, chances are you have this like sort of skeleton application. There's no data in it. And ultimately, data is really what's driving these web applications that we're building. So there's a bunch of different ways we can get that data. And this should be something that is like described, probably in the readme, or if it's a really elaborate process, then it should be either in I would, I would recommend you know, having a, a script that would do that through Fabric or Capistrano, uh, but there's also you know, the possibility that you like just have, um, you know, like you do a database number or something like that, which is like relatively easy. Um, so the, the different ways are having a database, gener uh, sorry, a data generation script. And so maybe you just have a high file that just generates a bunch of dummy data. And particularly if you want to do like some, you know, you're trying to figure out your scaling or your, you know, how, how your database is performing, even just on your local environment, this can really help. Well, I think there's a project called Django Factory Boy, which will generate like a bunch of uh, procedurally generated um, objects for you and populate your database that way. You may just write some custom high scripts as well. Um, you can also use fixtures, which would be just JSON file, JSON files. Uh, so this is my preferred way of just running like my tests. I try to keep my tests as simple as possible, uh, and just have a bunch of fixture files that basically just populate the database. Then you can have a database dump, which would be a SQL file, or you can actually replicate from production. So in a lot of cases, we're dealing with applications where like the production data is is uh, not something that you want to replicate to your local environment. So particularly being from DC. They're very cautious of that, like government applications, like they don't want to have personally identifiable information in your local environment. And so a lot of times what we'll have is instead of having like a production database replication script, we'll have like a staging environment where we have like a bunch of dummy data that's out there and we'll just pull that down. So we're just trying to figure out like how exactly um, to populate the database. So a couple things that I run, if I think it's going to be fixtures or I think there's fixtures out there, uh, I'll do like a, a grep with recursive fixtures.json, um, with the dot actually being like anything, and then, or like anything, any number of characters in there, um, and then any, any sort of pi file. So what this is actually doing is it's searching through all the pi files to figure out, okay, what, um, what files are out there. So if you have like a test.py and it's pointing to a fixtures file, it's going gonna, it's gonna to find it and it'll tell you. What this tells you is, is there one fixtures file for the entire thing, all the applications, or are they segregated into individual apps? Which can be really useful because you're like, wait, where's all the data? I populated this you know, core app, but actually all the data is separated among a bunch of different fixtures. Another way is just to do a find, uh, like find from here, and then the name of the file would be anything like .json. So if you only have like fixture files that are JSON files, then this is going to find all of them. But it'll basically provide you at a glance like what are the JSON files that are out there, so you can just figure out like, okay, again, is it one app or multiple apps that are sharing a, a similar uh, or the same fixture file? Okay, so this is pretty much like the last thing from a code base perspective. I look for tests. And 
this is usually the, the, like a huge gap, right? There can be a really good looking code base, uh, but if there's no test there, or I can't even figure out how to run the test, I've actually seen applications with like what looks like a pretty good test, test suite, but I can't run the test for the life of me. I can't figure out how they're supposed to be run. Like they're trying to populate all this data, and then I can't figure out, well, do these tests actually work? Or are they, you know, did at one point, you know, they had great tests, but then like a new developer came on and they just gave up. Like you just, you're not really sure like what to make of it. Um, so I prefer to err on the side of simple tests, like simple test, test population, test data population through fixtures, or like some sort of procedurally generated data, and just keep it as simple as possible. Um, but some people go more towards like the complicated. If you go towards the complicated test setups, you have multiple test suites, uh, custom test runners, that sort of thing, just make sure you have like documentation. Like there should be, this is one area where like some basic documentation is gonna be huge because if all of a sudden you have these test files and no one knows how to run them, no one can get the project up and started, then your tests are completely useless. And so that's like something that you really wanna make sure you have documentation if you have these custom test runners. So uh, a few different ways this can be laid out. Just you know, one <laughs> test.py file uh, with like one fixture file. Um, one thing to watch out for if you see this, like under each app, like the test.py, you're like, oh great, they have tests. Like, and then you do like a more on test.py, and then you see like, oh, it's like, you know, one plus one equals two. It's like the standard boilerplate test. So that's one thing to like watch out for. Is like, oh great, all these apps have tests. No, actually, they didn't take away the test.py file. They're just keeping the standard boilerplate. So. Uh, just watch out for that. If you think that there's tests, all of a sudden you may be very let down by that. So there can also be multiple test files in a subdirectory. So like maybe there's front end tests like Selenium, back end, um, you know, some stubbed out or locked tests. Uh, there's just a bunch of different ones. Smoke tests, like just you know, just making sure that the pages actually run. So this can be one way to sort of separate your tests if you feel like you have a huge test file. I prefer to just keep it in one test.py file, but you know, whatever you feel like is appropriate for your project in this case. Um, then you're just looking for the, the test runner. There can be like the standard Django test runner. Um, Django knows, I've used that before. It's, you know, I kind of go back and forth on how, how useful it is. Um, Django Jenkins also has a custom test runner. You can write your own test runner. But just make sure if you're going to be doing something complicated with it, then again, document that. How do I, from a basic project that I just cloned, run the test suite? Because that's just going to be so important for somebody who's new to the project just to be able to run the tests. Do you, do you have a favorite way of, uh, do you have a favorite of amongst these for a test runner? Yeah, uh, I've actually lately been just using Django Jenkins because I use Jenkins quite a bit, but I also just run it locally, and then I'll use it with coverage.py, so it'll generate the coverage reports for me. Um, it has its own test runner, and um, you know, it's not so complicated. The thing with Django knows is that it gets, it just gets complicated. Like they're searching for certain test files in a certain way, and a lot of times they match too many test files or something like blows up with it. So Django Jenkins tends to be a little bit more simplified. Again, it's not like the main intended purpose of Django Jenkins, but it, it is a more simplified test runner that I think works pretty well in most cases. Okay, so my testing philosophy is basically just get the test running. If I clone a repository, try to figure out you know, I'm new to a project or I'm trying to figure out whether to take on a project, just get the test running. What I'd like to do is I'd like to tell, you know, a prospective client or a team or something like that, hey, look, your test coverage right now is 5%. There's, like, and that's part of the reason why every time you push a change to production, you don't know whether it's going to break anything or not. <coughs> so add the coverage.py if it's necessary, and then just figure out, like, figure out, what, again, figure out the code coverage, and then figure out, like, where you think it can go, and just start adding tests over time. That way you have a metric to point to where you can say, look, you know, when I started on this project, and yes, I was just poking around trying to figure things out, your code coverage is at 5%, I've actually increased that to 60%. And oh, by the way, here's these really nice like HTML or PDF forms that show you, like, here's the code that was not being tested before, and here's the code that is now actually being tested. So that's how I justify, like, a lot of people say, like, oh yeah, I'm testing things. Like, I actually justify it with, like, metrics and say, like, here, before it wasn't being tested in any sort of automated way. And here it is now. It actually is um, being tested from an automated standpoint. And again, just like reviewing that with the client, so it's like metrics, metrics driven. Just to review, um, 
you know, first you just obtain the code. Uh, there's a certain way of handling the readme. Again, I have a blog post on this uh, that has like elaborates on this stuff. So like I know it's a lot to take away, you know, uh, for tonight. Um, but just to, like kind of think through uh, when you're thinking through this stuff, like at a later time, or you're evaluating your code base tomorrow, or something like that. Um, you know, there's certain things that should probably be in the readme, and there's different project structures and dependencies. But this is essentially what, what we covered from a code base perspective. Um, any questions on just the code base perspective at this point? Okay, if you think of something later, just let me know. The next two sections are very short. Um, the first one will just be deployment. So just thinking from a deployment perspective, Obviously, deployment is really important because ultimately, until your code goes to production, you really haven't done anything. At least that's my, my personal philosophy is it's not. The code isn't done until it's actually in production and it's actually working. Um, so just what I look for is, are there scripts? Is there any sort of, like, any basic documentation like, hey, hey here's how we deploy this thing. We've got a couple of shell scripts on the staging and the production servers. Or we use Fabric, or we use Capistrano, or Ansible. I actually haven't used Ansible personally, um, but I'm hearing some good things about it. Salt Stack is another thing. Obviously, they're not completely like the same. Um, Capistrano and Fabric tend to be like actual deployment tools, whereas the other ones are like environment infrastructure configuration tools. But there's different ways you can you can uh, use them in combination with each other. I'm just basically looking at. I'm trying to dive into something. Okay, what is being used, if anything, at this point? And then documentation that you would look for on deployment would just be, like, what are the IP addresses? If there's Sphinx docs documentation, that's awesome. We can build that. Um, I particularly like when there's like a PDF form that's like, here's all the usernames, and passwords, or here's you know, here and here's the IP addresses that we have for like our staging and our test environments. That way, you always have a latest update copy that's being built from from Sphinx that you can just point to and say like, okay, here's here's all the username, and passwords, that sort of thing. Have you used uh, Meldium for usernames and passwords? No, I haven't. Is that the one that aggregates like by team? So yeah, so, yeah. so basically we use it at Flightcar and you can yeah. just add users. So if you have a contractor or something, it's pretty easy. You add them in and you can kick someone out and like it gets rid of like your GitHub access and everything else, you know, because like it basically they're tied into like 250 services, everything you yeah. ever use, like new relic, AWS, whatever. Yeah, and so you guys were pretty happy with that? Yeah, so I, happy. Yeah, I have, I, have, uh, I have heard of that before. I have not used it, but it certainly seems like one that would be very useful, like in a, um, particularly in a dynamic team environment. What's, yeah. What's the name? Meldium? Meldium? L-D-I-U-M. Okay, Meldium. Cool. Uh, and then one thing to check for is like authentication schemes. So like if you have to be on the author, if your public key needs to be on, your public SSH key has to be in the authorized keys file, like who's the person that can add that? Because you know, if the engagement ended in a four way before and no one has a publicly authorized key to get into the server, I mean, you're going to have problems. Like, or it's going to take you, you're, you have to be up front with that expectation. Like, hey, it's going to take us weeks to get access to the server. You just have to say, you know, here's the situation. So that's one thing to test for, like, right away. Um, and, and, and do test for access, like, through SSH and, and just make sure that, you know, is this the user that actually uses virtual M? Um, is this one that I can use manage.py shell with? Just poking around. Um, and I'll kind of come up with a better checklist for this at a later point. So if we check back with that blog post. So I'm just going to continue to, to flush that out from a deployment perspective. And then services. Um, really, the questions, some, just some basic questions to ask. You know, what services are used? Are you using New Relic or using Copper Egg or whatnot? You know, do they run the full gamut of you know, just figuring out if your infrastructure is OK all the way up to like your payment processing, all that stuff? Again, there's usernames and passwords for all that stuff. Who has access to that, that sort of thing? Um, these basic questions so that you know who to go to when you're just jumping into this project. Another thing, uh, the last thing from a services perspective is just figuring out how services are tested locally. Um, one of the developers who used to work at our consulting firm and just joined um, a really cool startup in DC called TrackMaven, he was asking me, he's doing a lot of work with the Facebook API and, and also the LinkedIn API. And what they're finding is that they're testing these things locally and they'll just like break for like a few minutes at a time. And so you need to figure out like, well, how are you testing it? Are you testing it in a way that's like 
understands that the API may go down for like you know short bursts. So if you run your test and it fails, uh, is there a way to sort of like retest that? So I, I look for that test. That tends to get a little bit more advanced when it comes to like your test. Okay, just a few resources just to kind of wrap it up. Um, this Django project checklist that's a link to the blog post that I wrote today. There's a really, really great DjangoCon video from last year. I highly recommend it if you thought this talk was like interesting and you want to know more about, you know, from a different perspective, um, under the microscope, evaluating some Django code and onboarding a new client. Um, there's a company, I believe it was uh, Lake and Loop in Chicago that did this talk at DjangoCon last year. It was, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, it's a bit different than what I talked about, some overlap, um, but check that one out if you are still interested in learning more. Two Scoops of Django is a really great book for a lot of these best practices. Um, Lean Stack is a startup in San Francisco that I've been watching. And they basically will tell you about new services, third party services that are out there and what they're used for. And I think they have a service that will actually notify you when there are interesting developments about those services. Um, so that's one to kind of keep an eye on. Um, Hitchhiker's Guide to Python is, is uh, just, if you guys haven't heard of that yet, most of you started with Python and been using Python for a while, know that one. Uh, Ken Reitz, uh writes that. And then I have one that's, uh, that I'm building out, which is called Full Stack Python, which is basically like, Hitchhiker's Guide to Python is like really about like, Python itself and like the ecosystem around it. And this one is about like from a bare metal server all the way through your application, like explaining everything. like. Here's what a server is. Here, here's how it compares to the platform as a service. Like, so if you're interested from that perspective, that's something that I'm like building out right now. You can also do this uh, open source. You can do get get a pull request on it if you have improvements and that sort of thing. Okay, questions at this point. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, best practices. Um, I'm a little confused about static files, flat files. Yeah. What's a good directory structure? How do you tell it where to look? Yeah. So when I was putting this together, I, I definitely realized that that was like seriously lacking in this presentation. Um, the, and the, the part of the problem I had with it was you could pretty much create a presentation just on how to manage your media files and your static files, um, particularly when it comes to like a CDN. Uh, I personally, just like a sort of two minute thing, is I have my static files under you know my core app directory and then you know I use collect static um, and then I have a custom script that uploads them to an S3 bucket. Anything that's changed like based on a timestamp uploads that to an S3 bucket and then I use CloudFront as a CDN. But uh, again that's like not gonna work for everybody. So it's probably a longer discussion that we can we can have something I can look up. Um, there's a few different uh, resources that, that hand, about handling static files. Um, let's, let's, so we can talk afterwards about that. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's a big subject to get into. There's another talk idea. There's someone to take on. Back to the prior slide. Sure. Thanks. Any other questions at this point? I have a non-technical question. When you're going from city to city, where do you stay? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so um, I've been staying in a combination of like Airbnb, hotels. Uh, Brennan, my buddy here uh, from high school, who knows for like 15 years. He's not even a developer. He sat through this whole hour-long presentation. <laughs> just, uh, you know, I, I give him a lot of props. He, <laughs> just for that. Uh, so he, he does uh, commercial real estate here um, at, uh, at uh, Cressa. 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 Um, so if any of you guys are like looking for uh, like space, uh, he's the guy to talk to. But staying with him in Boston, so stay with a combination of family and friends, and um, uh, I stay like in the cities itself. Like I won't stay in between two cities, uh, but I've stayed in some pretty small towns, like even like just town Buffalo, Wyoming. It's like 4,000 people. Um, stayed there for a few days, which is pretty cool. So check out check out the blog. It's got a bunch of information, a bunch of pictures and stuff like that. And I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, you know, if you guys want to afterwards so anyway thank you guys for coming out it's been a real pleasure coming out here and uh, you know talking in Boston and I really appreciate you guys coming out hopefully uh, you got something out of this and uh, check out the blog post thanks again